that all of our students are learning. And so I wanted to say thank you to all of you, especially our parents as well. We could not do this work if it were not for you, for your engagement, for your collaboration, your partnership and your patience. It has truly been a collective effort on behalf of all. And I, before we jumped into this, I wanted to make sure I acknowledged and thanked you. And so this just shares our uh, agenda for today. So welcome and introductions. We'll go through again, a very brief overview of distance learning and what we have accomplished and information really that we're sharing. We will introduce all of our panelists that are here with us today. And then we will go right into the question and answer sessions that will be facilitated. It's co-facilitated by Mrs. Juanita Flores, Mr. John Santa and myself. And then we will end with some closing comments and we will um, let you go enjoy the rest of your evenings. Can you go ahead to the next slide, Mr. Irish? So I always start and try to remind our team here that we are really engaging in this work through the lens of equity and that we recognize educational excellence requires a deep commitment to this. And so we've defined it here. We worked with our school board on defining what does this actually mean that each student is receiving what they need when they need it in order to develop to their full potential. This is not to say that there are not uh, systemic inequities that we have to work together to dismantle. And that's certainly something we are committed to the, in order to set all of our students up to thrive and to receive what they need. It's important that we at least come from it from this particular a shared common understanding so that we can then work collectively to dismantle some systemic inequities so that all of our kids are set up to really thrive and do exceptional work. Next slide. So you've seen this slide before. These are just the phases. We are currently in phase one, that's distance learning. And um, phase two is having most of our students in distance learning and then offering in-person instruction and support for specific groups of students. And then phase three is the hybrid model where you, some of our students would be participating in distance learning for several days a week. And then a, other, a couple of days they'd be participating in in-person learning. And so I wanted to, before we move on, I wanted to speak a little bit about this because we did receive some questions. So just to make sure we all are on the same page, Two weeks ago, Governor Newsom released a blueprint for safer economies and that replaced the monitoring list, which had a structure previously that is now transitioned to a four tiered color coded system. And this system tracks all of the counties in California by the number of their COVID cases that are recorded every single day. And then they look at the positive cases it, within that county out of the total number of tests that have been administered. And that's how they come up with different tiers. And so yesterday, the state announced that San Mateo County moved from the purple tier, which was the widespread, to the red tier, which is the substantial spread. And so what that means is if a school district or a county remains in the red tier, they have to do so for 14 consecutive days. And then they may begin to start uh, planning for in-person instruction. But again, it has to be 14 consecutive days. And so we did receive a few questions about reopening of school and want, we wanted to share some information. So our board did approve our reopening plan on July 16th. And during that time, we outlined specific safety measures and protocols that we would be implementing across our facilities, which we have begun. And at this time, we are currently working with a local partner to offer learning hubs. If you were watching our board meetings, you heard Mr. Irish talk about this concept of a learning hub idea. And that was designed to support our families and our students' learning needs. More specific information is going to be coming about coming um, about that. But as we define what a learning hub is, because it's not a common term, similar to a learning system, it really is a safe, quiet place that is conducive to learning for students, particularly when we're thinking about it, it is for students who have the most academic need based on district criteria that we've established. They would go to this location, bring their school materials, and they'd have a dedicated adult that's there to supervise them, but also, and more importantly, to provide intervention support and assistance to our students. It can be assistance with their academics. It can be assistance in trying to motivate them to attend class every day, support with study skills, or even help with technology 
technology. And so um, these hubs are ideally designed to be small in nature, no more than one to two staff to up to 12 to 14 students only so that they can have the direct support that they need. So we are working with a partner to um, have these learning hubs available for our students. We also heard from our families, it's hard. And so it's a challenge to balance your own working life and to feel like you have to choose between working and staying home and helping your students. So we're looking at different ways that we can provide support. We also have Parks and Rec available who's offering childcare at several different locations right now. And that is another um, partnership that we have continued to foster so that we can provide ongoing support to our families. Just so our community knows, we have been engaged in preliminary discussions about when we might transition to phase two, but we still have more information. So I'm sure, sure that you are wondering, so what are the next steps so that we can get to the place where we know when we're going to be transitioning? So before we can bring any students or staff back onto campus for any type of learning, we have to negotiate with our labor groups and that will begin in the coming weeks. We also need to develop a COVID-19 testing plan so that we can have a plan in place to test um, people that are coming onto campus. And we have explored some partnerships already, including getting support from other government agencies so that it will um, help minimize the financial burden on the district because you do have to pay for testing, but we're looking for ways to offset or eliminate that cost for our district. And then of course, we will continue to work with all site leaders to ensure the implementation and monitoring of the safety protocols are happening. We then need to bring it to our school board, which we're planning on doing in the next month to discuss and identify a target date for transitioning. And then once that happens, we of course are going to communicate and communicate and communicate again. And also as a reminder, because this question came up, as part of our process before we transition, yes, we are planning to reconfirm parent decisions on whether they want their child or children to remain in distance learning or whether they want to participate in the hybrid model. So that is part of our planning process. And to, to cause um, any angst or worries that you have, we wanna alleviate that what we're trying to do, any transition that we're doing, we're looking to do it in an incremental way with the least amount of disruption to distance learning that's currently in place. We know this pandemic has upended people's lives and we are always striving to operate in ways that are inclusive and that are communicative and really collaborative. So we will be engaging our community, our staff, our teachers, our administrators, our families, so that we are working collectively and we are in sync. We know that you have established ongoing routines and so we will make sure that we are inclusive and we are communicating so that it's just clear across the board what we're doing and when we're planning on doing it so that you have time to plan for it. Next slide please Mr. Irish. This slide is really just wanted to share with our community how we have spent learning loss mitigation funds that we received. You can see we got $5.6 million and much of that has gone to technology devices, hotspots, software programs, Zoom video licenses. Next slide, please. Professional development for our staff. Um, we've set aside funds because we uh, recognize how important it is to address social emotional needs, specifically trauma-informed practices. And of course, we are also evaluating various supports for students that are struggling. So you heard me mention the support center or learning hub idea earlier. That's an option. So we've set aside money for that to engage in this work as well as online tutoring. Go ahead, Ms. thank you. I'm not going to go through this slide. I just wanted to share to date the technology that we have distributed across our school district. So you can see here the devices, hotspots that we've given to our families as well as our staff. This is really important. One of the questions was asking, well, where can I find information about um, what's happening related to distance learning or resources that I'm able to secure. And so on the main page of our district website, we have a distance learning hub tile and you can click that tile and it'll take you to, okay, so this is our district website. This is the tile on the far left. If you click that, it'll take you directly to the distance learning hub.
And you can see here we have resources and information and tutorials in both English and Spanish for our community. There's also a tech hotline. So you see there, so if you have any questions about technology, you can call this number 650-877-8700, extension 8611. It's an added resource to do whatever we can to try to support your efforts so that you are able to ensure your children can get on every single day. Thank you, Mr. Irish. It's just a screenshot. And so I end with this, to push for excellence today without continuing to push for access for less privileged students is to undermine the crucial but incomplete gains that have been made. Equity and excellence cannot be divided. And this is truly at the core and the heart of our school district. We know that there are inequities and we are committed to working in partnership with our families, especially with this pandemic, the challenges that it has caused for us. But we are really excited to continue to engage, to answer questions and to partner with you all so that we can do our best to serve all of our students really well. So at this moment, I would like to now turn it over to Mrs. Flores, who is going to um, take the lead on introducing each of our panelists, and then we will jump into our question and answer session tonight. Mrs. Flores. Before we begin, I'd like the, the panelists to please yourself. Um, if you can just indicate the role in the district, where you work, and the length of time you've worked in education. Uh, if we can start with Mr. Cavacho. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cavacha. I am the proud principal of Martin Elementary and I've been in our district. This will be my 16th year. Thank you. We can go on with uh, Mr. Lent, I think next, and then we'll just go from there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Lent. I'm the proud principal of El Camino High School. This is my sixth year at El Camino High School. Uh, 20 years, over 20 years in education in total. Thank you. Mr. Claiborne. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Claiborne. I am the child development co um, coordinator for the district. Um, I have been in early education and in child care for over 30 years uh, and uh, have been happily a part of the South San Francisco Unified School District for 19. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mert. Hello, I'm Debbie Mert. I'm the principal at Monteverde. I've been in education for 34 years, 31 of them in South San Francisco. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa. Good evening, my name is Ms. Osagara. I have been at South City High School for 19 years um, and I teach English. Thank you. Ms. Hahn. Hi there, my name is Barbara Hahn. I'm at Altaloma Middle School and I've been teaching math there for 17 years. Gotta tell you, best job ever. Thank you. Ms. Rovetta. Hi, I have, my name's Lori Garcia Rivetta. I teach third grade at Burry Burry Elementary School. I have been in education since 1989 and I went through all of South City schools from kindergarten on up and I've been teaching in South City on and off since 1992. Mr. Pasucci? Hi, my name is uh, Mr. Pasucci, Troy Pasucci. Um, I'm over at Ponderosa in my 24th year, 23 years over at Spruce. Um, all of my years have been in this district and um, just happy to, you know, be at a new place and, and experience new things. So um, looking forward to tonight. Thank you, welcome. Ms. Chan. Hi, my name is Marilyn Chan. Um, this is my six, 17th year in education and in the district. I am the ELA um, TOSA, which means I work with English teachers um, and English language arts teachers on um, professional development and curriculum. And I also teach English this year at El Camino High, ninth grade. Thank you. Ms. Burns. Hi, I'm Ms. Burns, third grade, Los Cerritos. Um, this is my fourth year in the district and 21st, 22nd year teaching in education. Great. Thank you. 
Mr. Gurney. Hi, I'm Greg Gorley. <clears throat> I'm the English teacher at Baden High School. This is going to be my second year, and I believe this is my fifth year in education. Thank you. Mr. Vina. Hi, I'm Brian Vina. I am a eighth grade social studies teacher at Westboro Middle School, and I've been at Westboro for 26 years. Thank you. Mr. Rachel. Hello, I'm Michael Reichel. I'm the principal at Alta Loma Middle School. I'm happy to be here for my fourth year. I've been in education for 24 years and have served in Oakland and San Francisco previous to this. And I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you. Mrs. Brosha. Hi, I'm Lucy Bradshaw. I'm the kindergarten teacher at Unipro Sarah, and I've been teaching in our district for 17 years. Thank you. Mr. Castillo. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Israel Castillo, principal at Spruce Elementary. Uh, this is my ninth year at Spruce. I've been in education for 24 years, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. This is Omer. Hi, I'm Julie Omer. I am a third grade teacher at Skyline. It's my fifth year there and my 20 something year in education. Thank you. Ms. Pam. Hi, I'm Helen Tam from Parkway Heights Middle School. I'm a special education teacher. Been in education for 15 years and been at Parkway for 12. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Yacubo. Hello, my name is Sabrina Yacoub, Director of Special Education for People Personnel. This is my second wonderful year here in South San Francisco. Um, this is my 22nd year in education, I think. 15 years in special education administration. Thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Grell? No, not here tonight? No, okay. Um, let's see. Who else is on here? Oh my God. Mr. Feng? No. Ms. Chan? I think he's an attendee. He's not a panelist. Ah, sorry. Okay, then uh, did I miss anybody? Just cabinet do if we need to. So I'll yeah, go. go ahead. Uh, Keith Irish, assistant Thank superintendent, <laughs> Ed Services, 22nd year in the field, third year with South City. Welcome. Thank you. I could go next. Uh, my name is Ted O. I'm the assistant superintendent of business services. I've been in school finance for close to 25 years, with five of those years in uh, South San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Spalding? Good evening, Jay Spaulding. I'm the head of human resources in the South San Francisco Unified School District. This is my 13th year in South San Francisco Unified and my 28th year in education. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Dr. Moore. Wonderful. So you can see the wealth of experience and expertise that we have tonight. So we are going to go ahead and jump into the questions. So I am going to start with Mrs. Ulmer um, from the elementary lens and then Mr. Lunt from the secondary lens. The first question, how or what should we do for PE at home? I love that question. And um, I really encourage everybody, if your teacher is not providing to PE to try to get your kid away from the screen for the afternoon. Um, we try our best to include as much as we can, but we do have limited time. Um, I, I just one idea is to, if you either have friends that have, have kids that would be interested or in your child's class to organize some kind of a group where the parents were taking turns organizing. So if you had five kids, you only had to do it once a week. But if you had 10 kids, you only have to do it once every other week. So um, that's one idea. There are a lot of computer programs, but again, I really encourage you to get your kids outside, ideally with other children so that they get that interaction. Thank you. Mr. Lunt, secondary. And to add to what Ms. Ulmer had mentioned, uh, it, it is crucially important to uh, find time to step away from the screen as much as possible. Our PE teachers, and I'm sure this is the case across our district, uh, really were intent on trying to provide the best experience possible, uh, blending instruction online, as well as incorporating uh, several aspects. There are logs that students need to keep, as already mentioned, 
one way a parent can really help support students in, in physical education is as much as possible, we know every situation is different, but to find a dedicated space so they can uh, stretch properly, uh, follow along with some of the, uh, the live uh, instruction uh, with PE, which usually is stretching and, and warm ups and so forth. There is also, there are several uh, units. I, I was able to witness a unit the other day uh, where they were learning about basic first aid and uh, they're using a lot of different uh, visuals and so forth. So there, it's not just about the physical aspect, although that is something that they need to keep up on. And one way, as always as parents, uh, to check in with them about their daily logs. How, how, ask them how much time, what, what, what logs are expected of them and uh, to keep up with that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Sanders, from our oops, let's hear from our, oh, that's, I'm sorry, Mr. Santa. That's okay, thank you. Let's hear from our elementary teachers. This question is directed to Mrs. Garcia Rivetta and then Ms. Burns. Um, what suggestions do you have about how we can bridge the learning gap for math since it builds on itself? Sorry, I, I enjoyed that question when I saw it because it presumes that we usually don't have a gap. And that's one of the things in education in, I've been teaching for a very long time and I've done every grade and I have never once had a class where everyone was at the same place. Gaps are just part of education. It's, it's what we do find what each kid needs and try and reach them there. So we work with small groups and in class, you know, we find the different levels, what they need and we put them together and work and with them. Now we have online, we have some additional great programs that are really helping us. IXL is a new program that we've, or it's not new, but it's new to us that we've brought in and it's amazing. Um, the kids go through and it finds for them maybe a skill that they missed in kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And we tell them, just go through and spend some time. Maybe you were sick that day or maybe you just didn't get something and this will find it for you. So it really is helping us. And it also points out if we have a few kids that have that same missing gap, then we can pull them together. And in our new Zoom breakout rooms, we pull our kids together and work in, can it work individually with them. Um, we also have our math program has an online component that we're using more. Um, it's called Think Central, and it provides online lessons where they can click a button and it has the ability to go step by step with each lesson. So it also then when they've worked through an example, they can try it again. So it allows the kid that needs a little more support in one thing to be working on that, where again, another child who maybe has flown through can move on and do a higher level. Um, so we also do math games and at home, um, for, for your support at home, for your child, if you're worried about them, then math games, playing things with them that involve math to make it comfortable and just making sure that math is part of your every day. And for most kids with most math all the way through, if you feel comfortable and you see it as something enjoyable that is possible and doable and see it as a challenge that you enjoy, you will do better with it than if you look at it as, oh, that's something I do at school from nine to 10 and you're kind of you know scared of it. So the more we just make them comfortable and allow them to work through again and fill in the gaps when we find them, I, I don't think that that's going to be a huge problem. So yes, I would um, agree. First of all, there's always gaps here and there. Um, and we always start with pre-assessments every year. Um, they are our starting point. Um, we want to find out every year, especially this year, where the gaps are. Um, and then we do targeted interventions of small groups. So we're going back to the basics more often than just once a week. Um, teachers are very aware of the responsibility of reteaching, designing new lessons that teach and fill any gaps in, math, in, in the math foundation skills and incorporate the new technology and tech programs um, to reinforce and practice their math skills. Um, the district has also given us and continues to offer us trainings in many subjects, including math, and um, as well as providing us with fabulous uh, math specialists, TOSAs is what we call them, that offer us additional assistance as needed. And it's been great to have them on our side. We have had staff meetings where we share concerns around learning loss that potentially occurred last year and where and what 
we should do, where we should begin this year. Um, I concur with um, some of the programs like IXL, Think Central, they self-adapt to where students' individual gaps are and innately they build, build upon themselves. Um, and it gives us and you reports of a problem area that can be shown to parents. So parents can also help um, with this work with their children in those specific problem areas. Um, and these are just a few of the math adopted programs teachers are using. Thank you. Let's hear from our secondary teachers. Uh, this is for Mr. Vina. My son's a freshman, and given the unorthodox transition into high school, I feel more responsible now to help him stay on top of his assignments. I have signed up for the daily emails. I have access, access to his grades, and I would like to know if I can contact his teachers directly to inquire about a missing assignment or missing credits for any assignment. Well, well first of all, I would congratulate the parent because they, they started off with the right steps. I mean, they're involved, they're checking the email, they're checking the different platforms, the teacher landing pages to see to check on their student. Um, before I would email, I would, I would probably recommend to the parent to talk to their student and see if they've checked in with the teacher first, especially with eighth grade and moving into high school, you need the students need to be self advocates and start advocating for themselves. Now, once you've talked with this, your, your child and if you're not really liking the answers they're giving, then I think it's totally appropriate for you to reach out to your, uh, to your child's teacher. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Ms. Ophagera, uh, I have a question for you. I would like clarification on what a Wednesday should look like academically. What is my ninth grade student supposed to do Wednesday as far as logging into class? Thank you so much for the question. We have been seeing some students struggle with the asynchronous Wednesdays. What we want to reinforce with them is that Wednesday is still a learning day. And what we are looking for is a measure of participation. So um, <clears throat> as teachers, we're still required to take attendance on Wednesday, but depending on the teacher, there's different ways that we can do that. Um, this can mean that a student will need to fill out a Google form for a teacher or complete an assignment. Most importantly, it means for your student that they need to go into their Google Classroom every morning just like they usually do and check in with each of their classes um, and their teacher will have left them instructions for what to do on Wednesday. If they are confused or if there is any question, they need to email their teacher before 3 p.m. We need to update our attendance by 3 p.m. And so it is very important that we hear from the students before that time. Thank you. All right, so this question is for Mrs. Bradshaw and Mr. Castillo. So what are additional ways in which we will support our English learners? Okay, um, so one thing, kind of the silver lining what, that I've found with distance learning is the opportunity to have an uninterrupted small group. I teach kindergarten, so you can imagine there's 20 kids when I'm trying to work with, with four on the side. Um, so being able to do small group work through Zoom gives them all an opportunity to speak. Um, they don't need to worry about if other students in the class are listening to our discussion, if they're seeing what books we're reading, you know, kids can be really sensitive about that. Um, so that has been a really nice added feature, something that's, that's going well with this. Um, the other thing that I found, and again, you know, I'm with kindergarten, so it's much different, but with assigning work in the classroom, if I give different students a different assignment, it's very noticeable to them um, and, and can make them uncomfortable. Whereas on Seesaw, I can easily assign different assignments to different students and no, they, they don't see each other's work. Um, the same thing can be uh, done on Google Classroom. And Seesaw will also allow me to repeat the directions, even, you know, at a slower rate to retell a story. So I find that there's a lot of ways that I can support them with the tools that we're now using. So 
that's kind of, you know, just, just from what I'm doing. But I, I will say with Google Classroom and with Seesaw, it's a blank canvas. It's not, there's not curriculum there that I'm clicking on. It, we have to create it and assign it and modify it if we can. So it's not quite very simple shooting it out there. there there's a, a process that takes time. I'm going to share, uh, go ahead and share as administrators. One thing that we've done is uh, we've collaborated with our teachers and provided some LPAC data. Our new director, Dr. Growth, and her TOSA teams were able to provide us new LPAC data that allows us to group students based on language development. So we've had an opportunity to really dissect this data and create small groups. And during the, our flex time for teachers, we have created some uh, synchronized learning with uh, breakout rooms with our paraprofessionals. Um, another thing that we've done is create additional support material, uh, packages that focuses on language development. Uh, this includes some front loading for new vocabulary uh, for next day's lesson. And it really helps with uh, scheduling our paraprofessionals uh, strategically to assist the students based on their LPAC levels. Uh, we've made some on-site appointments with uh, some parents that are dealing first time with technology usage, uh, even though the instructions and videos are, are there. Sometimes they need uh, in-person uh, instruction, support. So we've had some uh, parents come strategically following the distance learning protocols, but having them on-site so we can teach them and train them on how to implement this new device, the new um, ways of learning for this pandemic. Um, I've also prof uh, paraprofessionals and office staff has been communicating ongoing basis uh, to ensure that uh, students are completing activities and understand that sometimes you'll log out, but then you come back for your small group activities in the afternoon. And also encouraging teachers uh, visiting uh, through Zoom and encouraging to continue and maintain those strategies that are very effective for English learners. Uh, I know it's a different platform, but just that constant reminder that we are doing a different platform, but the specific strategies are still applicable, even though the platform is different. Uh, that's all I have, and I think uh, our teachers are doing a great job, and it's wonderful to be able to provide that support. And in addition to that, it's important to con continue the communication with our families and see what additional support they need. Uh, just in not just the academic portion, but also the other uh, needy things that may come uh, during this time. So support them, not just with the learning uh, implementation, but also the additional supports that may be within our neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. So another question, um, how can we support, this is for Mrs. Bradshaw, again, how can we support students with learning needs who may need extra help? Yeah, um, and the answer is kind of uh, similar, you know, uh, the opportunity to do un inter uninterrupted small group work um, where no one's aware of what I'm assigning on Seesaw, but also what I found to be really helpful is having data. Unfortunately, I love the data, so we're using literally to assess, and so for me, I can look at what, what elements of comprehension my kids are struggling with. Um, like right now it's details and story. So I can assign a specific assignments or change our class discussions to tailor them to what they're not doing well in with during assessments. Um, and also there's a lot more informal assessing you can do, um, you know, with, uh, with Google Classroom and Seesaw. So you can see how kids are answering questions and you get a, a pretty good feeling of, of what kind of supports they need. Thank you. All right. I have a, the next question and this is directed to Mrs. Garcia Rivetta and Mr. Irish. Uh, it is a statement that has a question in it. So I will read it and then request your responses. I want to applaud the teachers for putting together a collaborative and robust curriculum for virtual classes. Because it is going so well, I would like the school district to consider making Wednesdays a live school day as well as extending the school day on Mondays and Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. 
even a simple and short check-in on Wednesdays for 20 minutes or so will help. Is it possible to have live instruction on Wednesdays or at least a check-in? Particularly given to the shortened days for the rest of the week, my child gets so much from the live instruction and the routine it provides, consistency and structure. Go ahead. Mrs. R Mrs. Garcia Rivetta, your reply. So it, the question made me very happy. The idea if, if that the, their child is getting so much from it says a lot and that they think we're doing so well makes me very happy that we're making it look easy because I guarantee you it's not. And it, it correlates to the, you know, the old expression that it's trying to learn how to fly a plane while you're building it. You know, it's we're learning everything as we go along. So every teacher I know is spending hours after school weekends, we're learning all the technology, you know, the, the Google Classroom, as she mentioned, nothing's on there. We're having to learn how to post things to there, how to make it so it goes to each student and that you can actually get something back, how to organize it in a way that the kids can find it. We're learning how to post links and to do so many different things and getting information out to parents and meeting individually with parents and students meeting, trying to now set up times to meet with the speech therapists and our reading specialists, collaborating with our teammates, our grade level teammates in ways that we've never, we could quickly chat at recess and we don't have that anymore. So we're spending nights and weekends and all day Wednesday putting together all of this and trying to make it as seamless and successful as we can. Um, I guarantee you this is not the time to take that time away. We, we really don't have it. We're not just going, oh yeah, Wednesday we're sitting around. We are really working hard and we want it to be um, as productive as we can. So we need that time. And Wednesdays, I, you know, yes, we could get together for 20 minutes in the morning and that may not really change anything. But I also see that Wednesday as kind of a gift for these kids. They're learning some independence that they didn't have before. The first couple of weeks we had you know, whatever little simple assignment I put a little question on and maybe 15 of them couldn't figure out how to do it. And now they're all doing it and doing it on time. I had one kid today that I needed to redress. So they've learned how to take that, that responsibility on themselves and they're proud of it. And they're learning how to read through their Google Classroom and find their assignments. So I really don't see, I see that there's growth in the, the asynchronous Wednesday. And we're all hoping that eventually we'll move forward in our stages and reach a day when We'll be going back and forth day to day, right? We'll have synchronous and asynchronous. We don't want to just guide them all the way through and then say, okay, now you're asynchronous one day. They have one day a week where they have a list of lessons that they're working on. Um, I, I think that that's a really good thing. Um, if somebody needs and every class is different. So I think a teacher can up to them if they choose to meet with their kids in the morning and have a little check in and have, get things going. Um, but I don't think it's something we should mandate or take away that that asynchronous day. Um, I really think that we need all that time to be working on the things we're doing. Anything to add, Mr. Irish? Ms. Rovetta Garcia was eloquent. I couldn't say it better. The PD uh, that we're offering and the providing our teachers the time, I'll say it like this, it's still not enough on Wednesdays, but it's vital for us to continue to strive to provide great lessons and engage with our students. So I wholeheartedly agree. As we transition to possibly phase two or three, I think that's the time to start thinking about, like Ms. Garcia Rivetta uh, said about making a change to the whole schedule. Part of what we're really trying to focus on this year is organizational routines uh, for our students and our staff. So I just, I totally wholeheartedly agree, but I do understand because I am a parent, those Wednesdays can be hard. <laughs> I get it. So we're trying to balance both sides. Thank you. <clears throat> this is for Ms. Mert and Dr. Spaulding. What programs are available if students need mental health support and how might they access the help? Well, each of the elementary schools has a counselor and um, through YMCA. And the best thing to do would be to discuss it with the teacher because the teacher is the one who makes the uh, referral and then have the, either the teacher or the principal contact um, the counselor. And the counselor will be contacting the family and they will have to, of course, fill out a couple of forms, 
because this way, this year, we're doing uh, virtual sessions. And so they'll have to fill out the telehealth information sheet and um, approval from the parents. And sometimes what the parents may not realize is, and we have lots of families in, living in this situation where the, the parents are not together. So that means that each parent needs to give permission for the counseling to start with that child. But is it, it is accessible, contact the school. Thank you. Adding on to what Ms. Mertz said, there is support for our students at every school site. Our district committed approximately $450,000 about five years ago, most recently about a half million dollars to have counseling support, mental health support for all of our students at every single school site. So um, if there is any notice from parents, please reach out to your um, teacher's child's teacher um, as well as site supervisor so we can try to provide the needed support um, for your child. Can I add one Thank thing? Uh, I, I just wanted to say that on all the counseling websites, they have the San Mateo County resource page where they have a lot of the different kinds of um, liaisons that we have. We have YSB, youth student uh, um, counselors that come in that we contract with as well. So at the secondary, it would be your counselors, your best bet to get connected to all the information that's out there. But look at our counseling websites. I know it, all the middle schools at least, and I'm pretty sure the high schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reichel. This is from, from a parent of a secondary level student and is directed, uh, will be directed to Mrs. Chan, Ms., Mrs. Hahn, and Mr. Reichel. With so much of our students online, how can we as parents be sure our students are doing their own work and not getting answers from other kids or online sources? Any suggestions for parents on how to watch over this? You want me to go first? Do you guys want me to go first? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I thought that was a really good question too. Um, but I think if you're talking about like asking, going to the internet to do research or asking their friends for help, that's actually a good thing. Um, we want you to research. We want you to talk to, we want your kids to talk to other kids to get help with for answers. But if you're talking about um, just straight up copying, then that's not a good thing. We don't want that. Um, if, um, so as a parent, what I would do is I would ask my kids, you know, hey, ask them, have a conversation with them. Hey, what are you doing today? What are you learning today? Can you show me what you're doing? And look at their paper, look at their writing and see and ask them how they got it. So that way, you know, even if they got it from their friends, at least they can um, say, it, say it back to you and in their own words. As long as they use their own words, it means they got it. See, those are, those are good things. But if they're outright copying, um, then that's not good. How, you know, like I teach math. So for me, you know, math, like Ms. Um, Garcia Rivera said earlier, math builds on each other. So if they're asking um, their friends for help and all they're doing is copying their friend's answer, um, it's gonna eventually catch up to them because, you know, they may get away with that for that question, but there's gonna be another one that will, they're gonna need that knowledge to answer the next questions, right? So the best thing, you know, I always say is talk to your kids, ask your kids, ask them to show you what they did. And when you ask them to read it to you, to explain it to you and um, share their, their knowledge with you, that's always like a really good thing. And um, there's one more thing I wanna add before I give it to Marilyn. Um, um, working with your kids is actually a, a great thing. Asking your kids, looking at their work, those things are actually really good. Um, so I actually do this thing called Math After Dark. I'll do one little plug. I do this thing called Math After Dark where I want parents and their kids to come together and do math together. So it's like just one hour a week for four weeks in a row and the kids and the parents will do the math together with me and we actually have fun doing it. So if you're interested in doing it, look on my webpage, my landing page and go for it. Sorry, okay, Marilyn. Barbara, you were gonna say almost exactly the same thing I was gonna say, and that is to you know, talk to your kid about what they're learning and maybe asking just simple questions like, um, you know, what, what are you learning in your classes? What's going on? Is there anything interesting that you're doing? Um, and, uh, you know, I, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, I'd also like to add that um, 
you know, it would be good to to consider if your you know child is really um, um, maybe getting answers from other kids or trying to look for resources. Like, why? Why are they doing that? Like, is there something they're not understanding? And really, teachers are the resource, and that they need, that teachers are always willing to support the students. And so um, a good conversation would also be to, um, to, to um, talk to them about advocating for themselves, reaching out to their teacher and asking for help if they don't understand something rather than trying to find the answers on their own. Because the, the assignments that we give is supposed to help us um, see if they understand the content and not, not necessarily to, to just give them work for the sake of giving them work. Mr. Reichel? Do you have anything to add? Uh, not a lot. I, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, I think teaching kids the difference between plagiarism, which is directly stealing the exact work of someone else, and being able to interpret it in your own way, express it in your own way, and take something and be able to relate it back, which uh, helps us to learn much more deeply is something that the kids need to know because they might be confused about that. If they think they're only going for the answer rather than the process behind it, it's confusing. Thank you. This next question is for Ms. Tam or Mrs. Yaku. What support and therapy will students receive who have IEPs that designate therapy? When will these supports be provided? Would you like to go first? It'd be my pleasure, Ms. Tam. And then if you'd like to fill in the gaps after that, I'd be more than happy to collaborate with you on that. Sounds good. How's that work? Wonderful. Um, to answer your question, your IEP or your individualized education plan will designate what supports and services your child will receive, regardless of which phase we are in. How those services will be, will be provided will be communicated through the IDLP or the Individualized Distance Learning Plan, as it is now. When those services, those services will be provided will be communicated by the provider of which will be during the school day. The IDLP's purpose is to provide a description of how instruction, services, or both will be provided under emergency conditions in which school closure exceeds 10 school days of which we are currently experiencing. Your IDLP will be in effect until school resumes as 100% in-person learning which ends our emergency closure and when your offer of FAPE resumes. This is why at your next IEP meeting, you can expect to develop both your offer of FAPE as if you were in 100% in-person school, as well as your IDLP to show what your offer of FAPE looks like in the current phase of emergency school closure. As we move through the phases of reopening, if how your child is to receive their services changes, this will be reflected in their IDLP or Individualized Distance Learning Plan. In summary, the supports and services that are designated by your IEP will be provided. How and when will be delineated by the provider communicated by your IDLP or Individualized Distance Learning Plan. As we move through the phases, if this changes, the IDLP will be updated and provided to you. Helen, Ms. Tam, is there anything that we'd like to expand upon? No, I think uh, that was great. And I think that, that was a, a, that's a great question, a very valid question. So I appreciate, I appreciate that very much. But pretty much what Director Yacoub was saying is uh, on point where we are working to make sure that all the um, services and needs are being met in our current uh, COVID schedule. It is unprecedented times. So of course the schedule is looking very different than of course it would be in a regular school day before a pandemic. And so we're doing the best that we can to make sure the services are being met and case managers are working with all the service providers to try to match the services as best as possible given the different schedule. Um, it looks very different uh, than of course in-person learning. So uh, speech and language pathologists are sending links to students to join speech and language therapy uh, during the school day. Sometimes they might pull students out of class some um, other service providers like counselors and therapists are doing the same thing. Um, another option that I've had is that sometimes service providers join my Zoom class, but I pull them into a breakout room so that they can provide services for students 
um, in a breakout session. So we're trying to be creative and work with what we have, but I know that I've worked with um, Mr. Irish and Director Yacoub even before school started to try to figure out how to make this work. And I think it's looking pretty good. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Irish, do you have anything to add? <laughs> All right, um, this is for you, Mr. Lunt. How will advanced placement classes work with them having to take the AP exam in May when they will have new classes that semester? It's a great question. Uh, you know, this is something that we talked about quite a bit in the summer when we were looking at uh, certain schedule options. And obviously, as we all we all should now, now know that we our students in high school are taking uh, three classes this first half of the year and then four classes the second half of the year. So we have students currently taking AP courses, but all AP testing will be done in May. So that, that hence the question. What are we doing to prepare those students that are taking AP courses now versus those that will be taking the same AP courses perhaps in spring? The answer is, is ongoing. Uh, two major forms of, of resources that we have is one comes from College Board itself. College Board, Board is the entity that creates and governs the testing of AP courses. And they have provided several online resources for students and for teachers. Uh, that students can look at in real time within their units now, but also that resource will be available on in, during the spring terms when they're not taking the course. AP teachers met with uh, our meeting with their administrators uh, as well as talking about how we can support them during spring terms, which primarily can be in the form of after school uh, workshops, which they would normally do with all AP students that were taking the, co the course year round that maybe had forgotten a lot of the materials in the earlier part of the year anyways. So there are a lot of online resources as well as uh, plans for workshops after school tutorials and help leading up to that May test. Thank you. Okay, this next question is from an elementary parent and it is going to be addressed by Mr. Pasusic, Mr. Castillo, and Mr. Kavacha. I believe that the amount of work given after school ends for my elementary age students on the screen is too much. My kids are on the computer up to eight hours a day and we don't get outside. Can someone speak to this and speak to what homework is doing to show the teacher what they have learned? Um, I agree, eight hours is way too much. Um... It makes me question what actually the what is going on all day um, with that. So one of the the goals is four hours of instruction. So if we're we're you know my so I'll I'll, I'll talk about this um, last year. One of my students um, I, it was the end of the afternoon, and I I checked in with the parent and asked you know hey I haven't seen so and so online. Oh what do you mean she's been online all morning? She's been online all day. And I said, well, there's actually no work here. So she may have been online, but I don't know what she's doing. So as some people have been talking about, please make sure you, you talk to your children about what they're doing um, and ask them. So for this, I would recommend talking to the teacher directly and even the site administrator. Um, that is not the case. I would be up all night if I was planning eight hours of construction. Um, there's not enough time in the day for me to even review um, four hours beyond. So um, I guess for me, for homework, the, one of the parts of this question is, you know, what, what am I getting out of it as the teacher? After I'm giving my live instruction, I'm assigning asynchronous work, homework for them to work on that can tell me how they're doing. I can't really tell when I'm looking at, you know, a, a group of, you know, 20 boxes. I, you know, I can get a thumbs up, thumbs down. I can get some shared screens and things like that, but I don't get a lot of feedback. Where, where I can get that feedback is that independent time where they're doing IXL or Prodigy or Think Central. And then I can go, ooh, this child needs more help with this. And it drives my lessons for the next day or review days or what I need to do. Um, so again, talk to the, the teacher and the site administrator. That is definitely way too much. Um, getting them outside, getting them breaks. When you see that, when you see your child frustrated, it's okay, especially on an asynchronous day or during asynchronous work when they're not necessarily live with their teacher, 
to give them a break and get, take them outside for 15 minutes and 20 minutes, they can come back to those assignments, talk to the teacher and say, hey, it's been a rough afternoon. Can they, can they work on this this evening? So teachers are very, very flexible. Yeah, and uh, this is Kavacha. And to, to add to that, definitely uh, eight hours seems to be way too long. Uh, I think the theme for everyone this year is communicate, communicate, and communicate. Uh, I'm hoping that by, by now, um, uh, this particular parent was able to reach with the teacher and the administrator to see what was going on. Um, and also just to kind of add to what was said about instructional minutes, yes, um, for grades four and above, it's about four hours worth work of instructional minutes. For kinder, it's about 3.5, it's about three hours, 180 minutes, and grades one to three, uh, almost four hours. And so what that means basically, for example, for fourth grade and above, doesn't mean that they're gonna be there four hours, um, you know, glued on the screen. That's gonna be a combination of um, virtual learning with a class, uh, wh whether that's a whole class or the teacher are able to work in small groups. And then also part of that um, time will be our students be able to um, complete um, uh, independent work. Um, also, I just want to add um, in terms of um, homework, I do agree. It, uh, homework is supposed to be a way for us to measure what our students have learned, especially nowadays. You know, I, I can sit there, I can smile, I can nod. And if I'm the teacher, I'm like, man, you know, that student got it. He's smiling, he's nodding, but you wouldn't really know. So the homework is the extension of what was what's being taught that day. As far as the length of the homework, I think a lot of us are moving away with, you know, here's 100 problems and keep doing it. Uh, we are more about being able to give our students the chance to uh, have critical thinking and, and, you know, basically be able to ask two or three questions about what they were supposed to learn that day. And, um, you know, basically our teachers are able to see uh, what we need to, what they need to do in terms of adjusting their instruction. Um, and again, communicate. I, I highly, you know, for every parent that's uh, listening into this meeting, it's very important more than now, um, more than ever uh, for you to be able to reach out to the teachers. Our teachers are very resilient, uh, you know, on top of the old email system that we have. And yes, we're calling email old now because there's so many ways of being able to um, get in touch with our teachers and parents. Uh, we're using class dojos, Remind, uh, you know, um, which, which are, you know, programs that, that enables you to have, you know, ongoing communication, uh, almost kind of like a texting issue. So um, I would highly suggest check in with um, uh, that teacher and the administrator. I'll add to that, uh, pencil and paper activity and homework is very important and should be balanced with computer work. Uh, I think right now with, uh, with the, uh, the new uh, ways of teaching and learning right now, communication is key since we're not seeing each other on a daily basis during drop off and pick up. So yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Pasudic and uh, Mr. Kavacha. Communication is gonna be the key to success for any of us and for all of us. And homework should only be practice. It's, it shouldn't be something new. It, it's simply some practice to help internalize the learning. Uh, to internalize the learning, uh, students should only have five to 10 problems to practice and demonstrate comprehension. If your child is receiving 20 to 30 problems, I think it's a, a simple communication through email, call them. Always keep those lines of communication open with your teacher. Uh, if, the, if things don't change, then communicate with your administrator, but it is important to keep the lines of communication open with your teacher because that, that is your, your, uh, your team, your, your partner in the education of your child. Thank you. All right, so the next question is for Mr. Gourley and then Mrs. Tam and or Mr. Vina. And so if you guys have something similar, you can just say, I agree with what the, the, my colleague said. Can you provide parents with strategies on how to support students learning at home? What can parents do to help their kids be successful? I can go first if you want me to. So in thinking about an answer to this question, I thought I would run it by my students. Their responses might be summarized as follows. Help maintain a routine. Help them get up and be ready to log on in time for their first class. I know this may not be something all parents can do, but at least help them establish a routine 
and help them carry it out. They also said they needed autonomy, meaning leave them alone during class, just as it was when the school was in person. So this was the main feedback I received. I agree and echo their advice to you. However, I would like to add one more, and that would be to encourage them. There was a study done about how children learn best. The study was done in India. The researchers placed the computer in the middle of a neighborhood and directed children to learn and figure out a specific task. The researchers set up three different scenarios. The first found a person micromanaging the student's learning, directing and dictating their every move. The second scenario had the children learn the task without any adult supervision or direction, kids just learning from and with each other. The third had an old woman who they called a grandma figure, providing encouragement to the children as they worked together to learn the task. This grandma only said things like, oh, wow, good work, keep going, you got it. After assessing the children's learning, the researchers found the first to be the least effective, the second to be the second most effective, and the third to be the most effective scenario for children to learn in. So my point is to be hands off with your children, but give them encouraging positive support as they work through their distance learning. Even if you aren't able to be around during class time, ask them about what they learned and give them positive encouraging feedback. To sum up my response then, I would say help your children establish a routine, help by giving them space while they are doing their classes, and finally, perhaps most importantly, give them positive feedback and encouragement. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vina. Ms. Tam, anything to add? Uh, yes, I would uh, agree with that. And I would also like to reemphasize what Mr. Cavacha and Mr. Castillo said, uh, Castillo said, which is communication, communication. I think as a teacher, one of the most important things for me is when I uh, get feedback from parents. And so if there's anything that uh, the family needs, I know that in at our school site, there's been students who have needed technology, hotspots, school supplies, calculators, whatever it is, please let the school know, let the teachers know so that we can support you at home so that the students can learn best. So that collaboration is key. Thank you. From the elementary lens, are there strategies we can give our parents if they differed from what we heard at secondary? Ms. Ulmer and Mrs. garcia Rovetta? I, I uh, want to reiterate everything that was said already. It's the same for elementary. It's not overnight that they have to become more autonomous. So we are slowly stepping up the autonomy. Um, the quiet space, if they could have few interruptions, if it is going to be at all noisy where they are, our schools have earbuds for them. Um, and again, the check-in is really important. Um, I love the three stages and I totally agree to ask questions when they're all done with their work. What are you working on today? What, you know, what's your homework? Is there anything that you need to ask your teacher that wasn't clear to you? Um, and I think for elementary, the afternoon is a huge, it has a huge impact on their learning the next day. I want to say again, less screen time brings them more presence the next morning, get them outside. Um, if you can't get them outside, which is not reality for everybody, just start saving your toilet paper rolls and your paper towel rolls and your Kleenex boxes and say, what can you make with this stuff? They, they need to get their hands busy and their bodies away from the screen. Um, another idea is to have them keep a journal and a pencil with a pencil and paper instead of uh, virtually, um, just so that they can start thinking about how they're feeling uh, they don't all have the words to talk about the distress that they're having right now. Maybe you want to encourage them to draw pictures um, just to write what they can write. Um, and again, I mentioned this before with the PE, but seeing other kids is, is just, as we all know, missing for them. And any attempt you can to get them either, you know, preferably not on the computer, but in person. Hi, I would like to add to um, everything you guys have said has been great. Um, I, I, again, with the communication is everything. I think it, this goes with it, when we're online or back in class, but if your child tells you something that really doesn't make sense, always talk to the teacher first. Don't assume it's true, just find out, You know, have a conversation. Um, the other thing is kids really need help regularly and online with setting up and getting organized help them and if you just tell them go clean up they don't, they don't know what that means or organize your stuff they really 
benefit from explicit training in, you know, we put our things here and, you know, reading goes here to help them set up and make sure that they have a space. Even if your dining room table is crazy, but that's where they're going to be in the morning at the end of the night, clean it off and set up their space. So they know when they get up in the morning, they go and they sit, this is my learning space. And they know that their books and their pencils and whatever the papers they're going to need, they're all going to be there. They should not be reaching or calling to you or running around the house looking for their math book. Make sure they have everything there at the end of the day and then give them that space. Make it, let it be quiet. You know, these kids that are distracted, people are talking to them while they're in the middle of a call, handing them food. Um, let them, it, it's like, it's important. Let them know that what they're doing is important and it's just like they would be in class. This is where you are and this is what you're doing and respect them enough to help them help them with that, teach them how to do it, train them how to do it. Um, and again, then don't distract them while they're doing it. And the other thing I would say for teaching, helping um, students with learning at home, always, all grade levels, have reading and math be part of their, your lives, not just, oh yeah, you read at school or this is your reading time and your reading log. Reading should be all a part of everybody's lives. Read to each other, have them read to you, read to them. Even if they're older, you can read to them and it still increases their vocabulary and their comprehension because hopefully, you, you know, you'll be able in, to read at a level that's um, higher than theirs. And so you can share it with them and let them see you sharing books with your partner or your, your friends. So they know that reading is a part of everyone's lives and it's important. It's not just a school skill. And same with math. If you're, you know, making a recipe or planning a trip or a purchase, they see that math is part of our everyday lives. It's not just a school skill. So I think as we encourage our kids to know that what they're doing in school all day has a purpose. It's not just what you do from eight to 12 or eight to three. It's how you prepare yourself for the rest of your life. And the way you set yourself up now determines your success later on and opens your opportunities and your chances. So I, I think there's a lot parents can do. And what I hear mostly parents tend to worry about homework. They're always worried, what am I, how do I help my kid with their homework? And are they completing their homework? But parents are so much more important than that. You're, you're with them all day and the things you can do for them are numerous on top of just, homework will take care of itself. The teacher will see the next day, um, oh, the kid, you, you've got a problem or you're not completing it, we'll work on it. Um, but you checking in on the homework and saying, hey, what'd you learn today? Teach me something you learned. That can go really far, not drilling them, but sharing with them. So, Thank you so important. much. Um, this is for Ms. Mrs. Osagura or Mr. Lunt. We'll have either or, you both don't have to answer. How can students check their grades on school? school loop? My daughter can't see her grades, only I can on my parent account. Also, how can she see her graded work back from teachers to see what she got incorrect on her papers? Okay, I can take this one. I checked with our librarian, who's our like school loop guru. And she said that if a student is having trouble seeing their grades on their, <coughs> excuse me, on their school loop um, on the student end, underneath their listed courses, there's a line that says um, view grades. They need to click that in order to be able to see their grades for their classes and then everything should be okay. Um, and as far as uh, feedback for work, teachers are utilizing Google, uh, Google Classroom. And as we become more familiar with the various platforms and, and learning um, ways of learning through Nearpod and, and all these different apps and and, and instructional aids, teachers will become more comfortable with grading and feedback. It's a process. I know for myself, it was um, right now, teachers are still figuring out how to plan lessons and how to deliver lessons and um, engage students. And for the first few weeks, all of us were focused on building community in our classroom and um, building relationships with our students. And that was paramount to any content or curriculum. Now that we are deep into the curriculum, you're going to see a lot more of that feedback for your work, a lot more assessment, both formative and summative. Um, Google Classroom gives us the capacity to um, reply to work, to comment on work. And so I think as we um, become more comfortable, as more work is being submitted and more work of displaying student thought more than a right or wrong answer, like actually evaluating a student's thought process, um, you're going to see a lot more feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
This next question also concerns the hot button of homework, and it is directed to either Ms. Mert or Mr. Irish. Uh, I would like the district to consider eliminating homework. Our children spend an unhealthy amount of time in front of the screen. Do you have a do you have consistent practices for grade levels on how much they should time they should be spending on homework? I think homework is useless and they need to be children. Again, this is to Mrs. Mert or to Mr. Irish. Well, I can start. Uh, I'm the first person to say that children need to be outside and play more. Uh, but they also need to do their work. And as the teachers have all asked the parents tonight and confirmed, ask the teacher. The starting point should be checking with the teacher because I'm sure they're not assigning that much work for homework. Uh, we need to find out, is it really homework or is it unfit? finished classwork that the student is not completing in class. Uh, it could be a time management issue. As for a time period for elementary, normally our, our policy, and I know that Mr. Irish can speak to this, it came up last year and the board was looking at it. Uh, our old policy is about 20 minutes for first and second grade, less for kindergarten, no more than 30 minutes for third, about 40 for fourth and 50 for fifth. So no one should be working over an hour on homework at the elementary level. And you have to know that homework is a review of skills. It should be independent. The teacher teaches, they do some independent, they do some group work together it's the I do, we do, and then we turn it over to the you do. And you do should be independent and every student should be able to. And if they can't, then you should be contacting the teacher. And you have to look at it this way. It's also building responsibility. And we're talking about um, the need for students to be practicing things and um, getting in the good habits, it builds responsibility. And in, uh, in normal circumstances, it would be take it home, do it, and bring it back. And bring it back is usually the hardest part for homework. And we, we really don't understand that part at the school. And if you wanna get the students away from the screen, have them read. I can't think of one teacher that would be opposed or unhappy if the students were reading instead of sitting on the screen. Thank you, Ms. Mert. From the district side last year, um, the Ed Services team um, started researching, analyzing existing board policy and administrative regulations as Principal Mert indicated. We started looking at uh, numerous districts looking at their homework policy. Uh, we created a survey that we weren't able to administer yet. So it's one of our next steps for our staff to get input. So it is a topic of discussion um, amongst um, staff and internally in the district that we plan on remodifying or modifying if we need to, after we get input from all stakeholders on our homework policy, that BP and AR. And just to remind the public last year, this was one of our community forum topics uh, last year about uh, October, uh, October 8th. So just wanted to remind. So that's where we are right now. It's just something that when COVID came, sorry, we kind of halted and shifted our focus on uh, shelter in place and what we need to do to support our students and our staff uh, during the shelter in place. So it is definitely on our radar. It's something that we need to continue and move forward. Thank you. Um, we are in the home stretch. We have two more questions. Mr. Santa, if you wouldn't mind asking your question and then um, Ms. Flores will end with you and then we'll do a quick wrap up and, and let you guys go. Okay, no problem. I am concerned with the constant reiteration of children having to have their cameras on in their personal space. While I understand that they should and should show themselves, they are also at home and in a personal space and that should be respected. 
I am absolutely against telling a child that they cannot eat during class when they're only given one 10 minute break to eat and then use the restroom. Is there a reason why there isn't more time built in for students to take breaks and eat? And can you share more about why cameras must be on the entire time? This question is directed to Ms. Burns, Mr. Kovacha, and Ms. Mert, and has request for backup support for Mr. Irish and Dr. Spalding if needed. So as a parent myself and a teacher teaching mostly in my own home, I more than understand the challenges of keeping your camera on. Um, I myself have transformed my room, as you can see, my, in my kid's room into a mini classroom. Um, there might be toys and dirty laundry all about um, and believe me, I picked up <laughs> about an hour ago. So this distance learning is new to all of us, parents, teachers, and kids. We are all learning and doing the best we can. We definitely understand that you're in your own home and we need to respect your personal space. I really encourage you again to reach out to, and speak to your child's teacher about your own personal concerns um, regarding this manner. Teachers are always happy and super flexible um, to work with their families. I incorporate a snack and a lunch break into my teaching schedule. And as a parent, I too understand the importance of our kids getting a break to eat, decompress for a bit and use the bathroom. That being said, I give my own kids a much needed daily routine. We get ready for school, they eat breakfast and dress before they go online themselves. They, your students, your kids would not be allowed to eat in my classroom randomly in class if we were in person. Um, plus the technology that they're using shouldn't get food and beverages on them. Um, it's also really distracting um, as a teacher when my students are eating in front of the screen and it takes away from very valuable time from live teacher learning. Students keeping their cameras on is a main way we can make sure they're working, they're learning, they're participating answering our questions, doing work, and I have their undivided attention. If I can see them on screen, I can do quick checks, like a thumbs up, thumbs down, check for understanding, um, and monitor them. Um, so that's why we like to have them on camera. I'd like to add to that also, you know, last spring when we were starting off with this, the teachers all had relationships with the children and they knew the students and they knew who, who didn't understand things. They knew everything about them. As we start this year, we're trying to build relationships with the students in the class. And it is really difficult when you just see a letter for someone. And you can, while you cannot tell someone that they're gripping the pencil incorrectly, you can see a reaction, a puzzled look if they don't understand, or you can see sometimes when they're doing something else. If Mr. Pasudic had seen that student's face when she was playing her video games or watching YouTube, you know, when someone's laughing hysterically, you know they're not laughing at your screen share of your whiteboard. But we can also see the flash of light on their face. And myself, we have asked a student ongoing one day, please turn on your camera in the chat, please turn on your camera. I went over to the house, no one was there. The teacher was broadcasting to an empty home. So we need to know really what the students are doing. And if, if it's a privacy issue, I recommend that you put the student up against a wall so that it's not broadcasting in your home where other people may be walking or 
doing laundry or cooking for the children. There's ways around this. Um, and as all the teachers have said, we wanna be flexible, but it's, it's also a safety issue. If the camera's on, we see who's watching. We see who is watching the teacher and we see who's watching the rest of the class. And as one teacher put it, it's creepy when the camera is off because you don't know who's watching you. So I turn it over to Mr. Kavacha if he'd like to add anything. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. I mean, yes, I, I think this is all about setting up expectation and um, your students, um, you know, having the camera on is very important because we, we need to be able to see them. But um, I am sure, and just looking at all the different um, expectations our teachers have set for virtual learning, one of them is that we, we do allow students to turn off the camera, like what Ms. Merch saying, if you need a momentary privacy. Um, you know, the best case scenario is make sure you don't have the hallway on your background because we don't want to see who's coming in and out of the restroom and whatnot. Uh, the wall being behind you, I think, is, is the best bet. Uh, but if you if that's not a possible thing at home, uh, then definitely, um, you know, if, in cases like that, they can turn it off. But as, as far as them turning it off the whole time, um, you know, the expectations, they, they shouldn't be able to do that. Um, you know, as far as eating, um, I think it was mentioned earlier also that, uh, you know, it is a big... Um, change for everyone. Uh, you know, I think it was, uh, I shared that with our recent assembly, you know, before your home, and this is for us too, as, as teachers and whatnot, our, our home is a place where we're supposed to go and relax and not do work and um, do home things. But now we are expected to not only teachers, but our students, the home is not only that place anymore. Now they need to turn that place to a learning place. And, you know, having set a, um, uh, a schedule in the morning uh, when they're not expected to be on till 8.30. You know, perhaps, you know, one of the things that we rolled out is 8 to 8.30, that's your time. Get up, brush your teeth. Uh, some of our students are also dressing up as if they're going to school. And that's important because we want to be able to recreate as much as possible uh, a healthy learning environment. And if they're eating or they're just waking up, uh, you know, some of our students are uh, zooming, you know, like you can see their bed, they're still laying down. That's that's a no-no. We need, we need to make sure they're sitting up. I think it was Miss um, Garcia Roberto who said that, you know, it's important that, that you know, when, when they finish school, you, you go through the whole motion of let's clean up, put away your stuff somewhere, don't mix it with your play toys, because that's play, that's home play, but this is homeschool kind of thing. So, um, you know, by making sure they're not eating uh, in class, I think that just helps set the environment, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Anything from the assistant superintendents? They did a great job. They captured it. Yep. Yeah. Ms. Flores? This message is for Mr. Claybaum and Dr. Moore. Please let us know what the district child care is going to do for parents. Parents need more support with care under the DEPOP program. Can you share um, what will be provided for the person child care? Mr. Claybaum, you would the, like to speak? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the question. <clears throat> uh, we certainly realize that in the times that we're in that parents uh, do need child care. Uh, and so what we have done uh, is that we have reached out to our DDAP communities uh, and we have done two things. Um, we have shared with the communities um, to find out what the need was uh, and then we have also shared with the communities to, uh, um, to also share with them what we had available uh, to share or what we had available um, as, as a program. And so um, in terms of uh, the things that we are able to do or things that we are intending to do, um, we are happy to have um, more deeper complex uh, conversations with the site leaders um, to, uh, to ascertain the exact need uh, in terms of time frame, um, for the DDAP program, we are uh, a before and after school program. 
Uh, and so we would have to have some higher level conversations uh, in terms of those who are uh, connected to our regulatory agencies um, to see that if we can be able to um, assist in being one to um, help with the learning hubs. Uh, and so um, that's uh, one of the things that we would definitely do. Uh, and then we would also um, have uh, deeper conversations with our HR um, department. Um, our current uh, DDAP staff members um, have been, um, the workforce that we have has been reduced greatly. Uh, and so we would need to have a more deeper conversation so that we can uh, incur more staff to support us um, as we're going forward. Um, we would be happy to, and we will definitely do this, um, train um, the staff for um, in-class, in-person uh, care. Uh, in terms of um, just the um, guidelines and the procedures and the protocols uh, that are needed in the COVID climate that we are in. Um, and uh, we'll just be happy to um, do all that we can to assist um, our community. Um, we, are, uh, we have um, three communities that we serve uh, with the DDAP program. We serve the Berry Berry community. We also serve um, the Juniper Serra uh, community and we also serve Skyline. Uh, at one of those communities, we are actually serving um, students in person. Um, the other um, community, one of the other communities, Skyline, we uh, put out some information uh, to, um, to see what the need was. And currently it appeared that there was um, not the same in-person need for Skyline. Um, so um, with regard to uh, our Burry Burry community, uh, we're still in uh, a, um, a situation where we realize that there is some in-person need. Uh, and so we're um, intending to have deeper conversations so that we can facilitate that need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Claybon. The only thing I would add is that we currently have child care at several of our elementary campuses, Burry Burry, Monteverde, Ponderosa, Los Cerritos, um, Spruce, Martin, and then you heard we had JS through the school district. So there are opportunities. I know on a couple of these campuses, they will also be looking at their waiting list. So I would encourage you to reach out and connect with the uh, site leader and, and talk to them about childcare. And remember, we're also working on the learning hub idea with one of our other local partners. And so we hear the need and we are doing our very best to respond to the need. And um, again, if you uh, want to find out more about a specific child Child care need on your child's campus, please reach out to the site leader. And so I just have to say, I'm going to just sit here by myself in my office and clap for you guys. You all are amazing. We have over 460 years of experience sitting here with us today. So that tells you the, the experience, the expertise. There is such a willingness of our community to provide support. We heard a lot of themes about communication, engage, reach out, provide support, ask questions, interact with your kids. That is really what it's all about. I wanna thank every single one of our panelists. You all did an amazing job representing your schools and our school district. I wanna thank our families for engaging as well. Um, if you have other ideas, if you like this type of format or you want a specific topic, please feel comfortable and free to email at communications at ssfusd.org so that we can hear your feedback, hear what you need so that we can meet that need. Um, we're happy to do that. And if we did not address any of your questions, we have an FAQ. It is located on the front page of our website. We will take those questions that we were not able to respond to. We will build them into our FAQ. Before I say goodbye, I'm going to turn it over to our PTA council, who I'm certain has some final words that she also wants to share or reminders for you. And then we will let you go. Dr. Moore said, thank you, everyone, for taking your time tonight and helping us out with this. Um, also, I'd like to please remind everyone, join your PTA. Ask up uh, your parents, the grandparents, the uncles, the aunts, the neighbors, anybody, the guy at the supermarket, your best friend, anybody, everybody could be a member. We need to get our numbers up. Just because we're not in school, we're still a PTA and we need to keep strong. So please, please help your PTA go up. Thank you very much. Wonderful. We are going to end with this quote. I'm sorry, Mr. Santa, would you like to say anything as well? No, thank no? you, ma'am. 
Okay. We're going to end tonight. I have a quote, Coretta Scott King, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. And again, we are so thankful for our community and your compassion and your grace. And we thank you for engaging and being partners with us. Have a wonderful evening and thank you again, wonderful panelists. Good night Bye. and thank you everyone. Bye.